And so how are we going to arrest young men's attention to the fact that they ought to be working and laboring on jobs to try to earn money to take care of the children they brought into this world? How are we going to be able to do it? We can't even do it with the court. They'll duck and dodge the court. Can't do it with the family law judges. They, they can't keep up with them. I don't want to lock them up. No, that makes no sense to me. I went down to the judge. I said, well, he said, well, he owes $10,000 in bond, by child support. I said, well, if you lock him up, then we pay $48.50 for him to be up at the South Central Hilton. He's still not going to pay child support. So what sense does that make? Now make the brother get a job. And then garnish his wages until he pays it back. This sounds to be hard, don't know. That's what we got to do. That's where we are. Men got to work, got to be willing to work. But I don't think apart from the word of God, if we can convince people of that. We've been going down this road for so long, I don't think we can convince them of that. But only God can convince them. I created you to be creative. I created you to do stuff. And you are imitating me and emulating me when you do stuff, when you labor, and when you work. So people need to be convicted of that. So we need to be reminded we got the power that God can use us to touch people's lives. So Peter says to them, verse 30, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, people today don't really think they need to repent. They don't really understand that it's, it's the way we think it's our problem. Because the thinking that we have in our head it dictates what we do. And so we live out what we're thinking. So people don't realize, now I need to repent. The way I think is wrong. The way I've been conditioned to think is wrong because my thought leaves God out. See, anything that leaves God out will get you to the wrong destination. And so repentance is realizing I've been leaving God out. I've been leaving God out of my life. I've been at the center of my own world, my own universe. So repentance says I turn away from being self-centered to being God-centered. And now I want God to come in and to help me think thoughts after him so I can think the way he wants me to think. And if I think the way he wants me to think, then I can act and do what he wants me to do. And so money alone is not the solution. I have figured that out. Because the people with the most money in many cases are in the biggest trouble. Look at these pro athletes. Look at some of these entertainers out in Hollywood. They got to, because now they got time and money on their hands, but they don't have God in their heart nor in their mind. And so they live in a place that just targets them with perversion and with decadent ideas and with decadent opportunities to, to live out crazy stuff that's inside of their heads. Don't you know you can't do everything you think? You cannot, everything you think in your mind, you cannot do it. And everything you think in your head, you can't even say it. Some stuff you need to say, Lord, deliver me from this. I would have found me a new song. I'm going to get the words for it. Mel Haggard. I love these, these country western guys. I figured out they make the best music. They're telling real stories, you know. And Mel Haggard got one story out. He said, learning to live with myself. I'm going to put it in the bulletin. It's a powerful song. Learning to live with myself, that is the problem. i got to live with myself and with all the craziness that's in my head. And that's what Paul was talking about. Paul says the good that I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those things I do. What Paul was saying, I can't live with myself. Who can deliver me from me, Paul said. And he says, thank God for Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ can deliver me from me and from the destruction that's inside of me. So the word of God forces people to come front and center with themselves, with the me that's inside of me that has developed over all of these years. The word of God forces us to deal with ourselves and to understand if I'm going to change me, it's going to take something more powerful than me because the me inside of me is controlling me. But the power of God coming inside of me can deliver me from myself where I can live in a way to serve God and be pleasing to God. So Paul said, you got to repent and you got to receive forgiveness. And then you can receive the promise that God has made. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Why do we need the church to remind us the power that we have and to remind us of the power that we have experienced? 
And that's why we as Christians, we really got to cry out before God, Lord, to change me. Let's not be satisfied with just going to heaven. Let's not be satisfied with just escaping the fiery uh, uh, judgment of hell. No, let's won't ask God to help us to change us in real time. To be changed in real time so that we can experience the power of God to transform our lives. So our transformed lives, they become living testimonies of the power of God. Can I get a witness? Now, I ain't meddling with nobody. So don't think I'm meddling and I, I'm going to say something. I'm going to close my eyes so I don't see nobody. All right? Now, if I go out here telling people how God can deliver people from something, and I got a cigarette and a cigar in my mouth. The Sergeant General already told me, it's on the pack now, you see. It's already told me, cannot God deliver me from nicotine? Help me, somebody. So I got to get delivered from something before I can say that God has the power to deliver. So the very thing in my life that I don't want to give up, that I know I need to give up, that's why I need to be falling in before God. Lord, help me to overcome this by your power and your grace so I can stand up and tell somebody, this right here had control of me. But by the power of God, I've been set free. Will somebody help me? That's what it means to be a Christian. Salvation is by grace, through faith. It's the gift of God. So yes, I believe that Christians can drink and smoke and gamble. I believe they can do all of that stuff and get to heaven prematurely, as a matter of fact. Get there faster than what God intended for them to be, as a matter of fact. Some of us are going to get to heaven, and when we get up there, the angels are going to say, well, your marriage ain't ready yet. We weren't expecting you this soon. It's like you go to a hotel. You get there at 10 o'clock in the morning, tell me you're going to check it. No, you can't check it on 10 o'clock. Check in time is 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't want us to get to heaven prematurely. Live out all the days that God has for us down here. Because the longer we live out our days down here, the more God has the opportunity to change us and to transform us and to basically create a metamorphosis inside of us so that other people can see that we are being changed and that gives us greater credibility to, to testify to the power of God. So the promise is to all who are far off. You know, sometimes as we're trying to live out our Christian life, it's easy for us to say, there's no hope for them. But y'all know y'all got some cousins like that. <laughs> y'all got some cousins that when y'all have your family reunion, you just, you just conveniently lose their address. Can't find their phone number. Because you don't want them to show up. Because you know when they come, they're going to wreak havoc. You say, ain't no hope for them. Ain't no hope for them. You see, y'all ought to stop being so self-righteous. I got folks like that in my family, you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to duck them and dodge them because man, I don't even want to deal with them. But the very people that I don't think no hope for, that's who the gospel needs. That's who needs the gospel. And they need exposure to the gospel. And they need exposure to us. If for nothing else to see that we still have patience, and that we're not so self-righteous that we don't have time to talk to them or spend time with them, enjoy a hamburger or a hot dog, and listen to old crazy stories. You ever, you ever know when you get around crazy people, they, they just keep telling the same stories over and over again. It's just the same thing. Over They just keep living the same thing. They're caught up in this loop so over and over again in their head, over and over again in their mind. They keep telling the same thing, the same thing over and over again. But by grace, maybe our presence in their lives can give them hope that they're not so far away, that somebody's not still praying for them, hoping and believing. Let me wrap this up. We got communion to do here in a few minutes. He says, and with many other things, verse 40, words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse nation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Why do we need the church so that we can be reminded of the power that we have. The power that God has invested in us to proclaim the gospel. The power that God has invested in us to produce fruit in our lives, to give evidence that we have experienced the gospel. The power that God has placed upon us 
to be his laborers to bring in this harvest of souls as Peter does in the Apostles.